We're now ready to move into Chapter 11 in our Anatomy and Physiology 1 course. This marks the beginning of our last big section of material we will cover in Anatomy and Physiology 1. Our next five chapters cover the nervous system. So this Chapter 11 is going to include all of our fundamentals for the next five chapters we cover. In Chapter 11, we are going to go through the microscopic structure of nervous tissue and look at the physiology on that microscopic level. So this is going to be a pretty intense chapter. I said the same thing when we went through Chapter 9. You have got to devote some time to this for it to truly make sense to you. If you understood the way muscle tissue contracts, then Chapter 11 should be much easier for you. However, if you've gotten behind and you still don't really understand the material we went through in Chapter 9, Chapter 11 is going to be even more difficult for you. I say this not to scare you or make you feel nervous about the chapter, but I want you to understand how important it is for you to put the time in that is required for you to understand Chapter 11. I'm going to split the lecture into at least two parts because I want you to spend some time learning some terminology before you go into the more in-depth physiology. Our nervous system is really separated into three major functional parts. There's the sensory portion, the area where integration occurs, and then the motor portion. This we kind of separate the nervous system in this manner to make sure you realize that even though these different parts are composed of the same type of material, they really have a different job to do. The sensory part of your nervous system is the part of your nervous system that allows you to sense or gather sensory information from your external environment or your internal environment that is part of the inside of your body but is not part of your nervous system. The sensory input, whatever that may be in this picture that is the eye is looking at something, that input has to travel through your nervous system in the direction from the sensory receptor to your brain. This is, as we go through the chapter, what we are going to know as the afferent part of your nervous system. The sensory input what, going from the outside of the nervous system, being sensed by a sensory receptor, traveling through the afferent nervous system to your brain. Once you sense something, it is integrated in the brain. This integration is where you figure out what it was that you, in this example, saw and what you need to do about it. Then we have nervous tissue going in the opposite direction from the brain to your muscles that will allow you to respond to whatever sensory input you had. Now this part is what we know as our efferent pathways. Now in this example, kind of hard to see real life, but let's, let's do something real life. Let's say, or let's change this a little. I am extremely thirsty. It has been so long since I've had something to drink. My body is going to be in need of something to drink, right? Something liquid. So my eyes, their job is to look for something to drink. When my eyes see this liquid, my eyes have, this is a sensory input. My eyes are seeing that liquid. The information from my eyes travels to my brain. My brain now has to integrate what my eye is seeing. My eye does not know what I'm looking at. My brain has to use the information that is sent from my eye to it and figure out, hey, I'm looking at something to drink. And I would really like to drink that. 
So not only does my brain need to figure out, hey, that's something to drink, but my brain has to send the information to my muscles that will tell my muscles in my hand, grab that drink. Then it will tell the muscles in my arm, contract, move that drink to my mouth so that I may ingest this drink. But you never sat down and thought about how much was involved with you looking at a glass of water and picking it up and drinking it. A lot of things are happening. Let's take a look at how we're going to divide our, immune, our, excuse me, our nervous system as we go through this. We're going to separate our nervous system into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Your central nervous system is just made of your brain and spinal cord. So I'm going to try to draw a straight line. So everything on this side of this line, that's your central nervous system. Everything else in your body is part of the peripheral nervous system. Your central nervous system has many extensions that come out of it called nerves. The nerves are what make up your peripheral nervous system. You have cranial nerves that come out of your brain directly, and you have spinal nerves that come out of your spine. The peripheral nervous system is further broken down into the sensory region and the motor region, which is what I was showing you here in this first picture. So in this picture, just this stuff right here, the brain and the spinal cord, where integration occurs, that's your central nervous system. Your sensory area, the afferent signals that travel to your brain, and your motor areas, the efferent signals that travel from your brain to your muscles, these are going to be part of your peripheral nervous system made of nerves. As we get further into chapter 13 and 14, we'll take a closer look at how the different parts of the motor division of your peripheral nervous system are separated. Your motor division is first branched into your somatic nervous system and your autonomic nervous system. Your somatic nervous system is the voluntary part of your body, the muscles you can control. The autonomic nervous system, that's the part of your muscles that you have no control over, such as your cardiac muscles, your smooth muscles, things like that. And then your autonomic nervous system, these muscles you can't control, are separated into your sympathetic and your parasympathetic division. And your, the muscles you have no physical control over, the ones your brain controls, they're either going to be in the sympathetic mode, which is your body trying to mobilize you to do some sort of activity, or they're going to be in parasympathetic mode, which is your body trying to conserve energy when you're at rest, doing your housekeeping sort of functions. We're going to go over all of these things in the peripheral nervous system in much more detail as we go into the next few chapters. Now I want to, I guess, switch gears a little now that we've introduced how the nervous system works to you briefly and start looking at the nervous tissue. So recall, tissues work together to make organs. So we're going to get to chapter 12 before we start talking about the brain and the spinal cord. Right now we're just looking at nervous tissue, the cells that make up our nervous tissue. If you recall from chapter 4, we learned what nervous tissue looked like under the microscope, right? It, was, it looked to me like um, kites with long kite strings. But if you go back and look at that in a little more detail, you'll see not only do you see the large cells that kind of look like kites, you also could see really small little tiny dots or cells in the background. The big cells you could see were the neurons. Those are the important most important cell types in nervous tissue, these are the ones that can actually send an electrical signal from one cell to another. What looks like tiny dots in the background are known as neuroglia, several different types of supporting cells. We're going to look at neurons in a minute, but first let's look at what these supporting cells are for. The first type of neuroglial cells you have are astrocytes. You have more astrocytes than any other neuroglial cells, and their job is to support and brace the neurons. If we look at this picture here, this shows you an astrocyte, 
and this goldish looking thing in the background is the neuron. The astrocyte has all of these arms that reach up and grab a hold of the neuron. Almost, I like to think of as forming a scaffolding, a little network, a, a shelf for all of the neurons to sit and hold them in place. While this astrocyte is holding the neurons in place, it's also helping to take nutrition from this capillary and make sure that the neuron gets that. It holds the capillary, which is bringing nutrition close to the neuron. The second type of neuroglial cell is a microglia. Microglial cells look more like this guy. They have lots of long processes. Their job is to destroy any sort of pathogen that has made it into your nervous tissue. It's very important that we keep our nervous tissue sterile, free from pathogens, free from any sort of microbe that can hurt us. So if a bacteria does make its way here, you have little microglial cells to destroy that pathogen before it can hurt your neuron. The third type of neuroglial cell is called an ependymal cell. Epidemal cells line all of the fluid-filled cavities in your brain and spinal cord. Not only do they line the fluid-filled cavities, they actually make the fluid that is going into this cavity. And the fluid in this cavity is known as CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. It's not just spinal fluid. You have it in your brain and in your spinal cord. So anywhere you need it made, that's where you're going to line the cavity with these epidemal cells. The third, excuse me, the fourth type of neuroglial cell is called an oligodendrocyte. Oligodendrocytes wrap around all of your central nervous system cell fibers. Okay? So that's what this is showing you down here. These are your nerves underneath it. And the blue is a covering, a coating of those nerves. It functions to insulate the nerves. Now the four we've gone through so far, astrocytes, microglial, epidemal, and oligodendrocytes, those are only found in the central nervous system. The other two types of neuroglial cells, called satellite cells and Schwann cells, they are only found in the peripheral nervous system. The satellite cells and the Schwann cells function in exactly the same way as the oligodendrocytes. They wrap around different parts of the neuron to form an insulation. Now let's look at what the neuron itself looks like. The neuron itself has three major regions. This more circular region here, that is known as the cell body, or the soma, or the perikaryon. Three different names for the exact same thing. Inside of the cell body, you have most of the normal organelles of any eukaryotic cell. You're going to have a nucleus with a nucleolus. You're going to have uh, mitochondria. You're going to have rough ER. We just call them nissel bodies instead of calling them rough ER, and that just has to do with how they were originally discovered and stained. You're going to see other organelles, Golgi, different things like that. Okay. Just all the normal working parts of a cell. The other two major regions of a neuron, in addition to the cell body, are all of these little branching extensions up here known as dendrites, and then this long extension here known as the axon. The dendrites are the receptive region. That means if we were looking at the direction in which an electrical signal would travel through this neuron, the electrical signal will come into the dendrite through the cell body. It will then come down this merging part of the cell body called the axon hillock. And then the signal will travel down the axon, leave the axon, and go into the dendrite of the next neuron. The path, the information must always flow in this direction. The path has to go this way. You cannot go the other direction. 
Now, in this particular picture, they're showing you that the axon of your neuron is surrounded by Schwann cells. So is this a central nervous system neuron or a peripheral nervous system neuron? Peripheral nervous system. If it was a central nervous system, it would have oligodendrocytes instead of Schwann cells. The reason I'm pointing this out is I want you to see there's a little bit of a confusing terminology we sometimes see. Schwann cell is the entire cell that is wrapped around the, neuro, the axon right here. The gaps in between one Schwann cell to another are called nodes of Ranvier. Now notice this labeling right here. It's called the neurolemma. It looks like it's pointing to the Schwann cell, right? The Schwann cell is the entire cell. The neurolemma is just the thick outside coating of one Schwann cell. I'm going to try to find another picture. Here we go. Okay. So here's the showing you. Here's one Schwann cell wrapping around the axon. It keeps wrapping and wrapping and wrapping, getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Once it finishes wrapping, the really, really tightly wrapped part on the inside is called the myelin sheath. And then the bulging single layer on the outside where your nucleus is going to be found, that's called the neurolemma. A lot of times that confuses people, so make sure you take a look at that. Now there's a little bit more important terminology on this slide that I kind of skipped ahead of, so let's go back here. Again, we said the dendrites, those are the ones that receive the information. They're shorter. They're usually more branched. The axons are the part of the neuron that sends the information. You're usually going to only have one axon per cell. It doesn't have all the branching you see with dendrites. Instead, you're just going to have a little bit of, you may have some terminal knobs at the end. So if we go back to this picture, you see how you have these different axon terminals. Still just one axon, but it kind of branches at the end. Anytime you have a bundle of processes, whether it's a bundle of dendrites or axons, if that bundle is in the central nervous system, we call it a tract. If the bundle is in the peripheral nervous system, we call it a nerve. So make sure you keep up with that terminology. You're going to need that throughout the next five chapters. Okay? And the way you kind of need to keep that in mind is you're never going to have just one neuron by itself. They're always going to be grouped together. So a group of the processes, the pieces sticking out of the cell body, if those are found in the central nervous system, we call them tracts. If they're found in the peripheral nervous system, we call them nerves. We're going to talk a little bit more about myelin sheath later, but again, that's just where the Schwann cells have wrapped around, the axon. Anytime you look on the gross level at the brain, you're going to see light areas and darker areas. Anytime you have more of those Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes, you have more of that wrapping known as the myelin sheath, the area is going to look lighter, so we call it white matter. Anytime you have less or none of that Schwann cell oligodendrocyte, none of the myelin sheath, we're going to call it gray matter. This is going to be much more important when we get to chapter 12. We're going to see this again. In addition to just looking at a neuron and being able to label the different parts we just went through, you need to be able to classify the neuron as multipolar, bipolar, or unipolar. A multipolar neuron is the most common type you will see. It has one axon with many different dendrites. The characteristic picture I used to show you the different parts was a multipolar neuron. We see multipolar neurons anywhere the neuron is connected to a muscle as well as all of the interneurons in the brain. Bipolar neurons have one axon and one dendrite. These are extremely rare and only found in the retina in the eye. 
So we really won't see these until we get to chapter 15. Unipolar neurons have one single short process coming out of its cell body. You're going to see unipolar neurons in some of your peripheral processes mainly associated with sensory receptors. So let's take a look at how these look differently. Here's our multipolar neuron, many dendrites. So this is going to be the receptive region. And one axon, that's going to be your more conducting region. Okay. Here we have the bipolar, so cell body in the center. One long dendrite, so here's your receptive region. Then one long axon, conducting region. Here, cell body at the top with one single process, usually called just an axon itself, in the bottom. So you're going to have very little sh tiny short receptive piece here, then a really long conducting region here. Now that's classifying neurons by how they look. But as we saw in the very first slide we went through in this chapter, we can classify neurons by how they function. Neurons are considered sensory if they're afferent, if they're taking information from the external environment within the body or outside of the body to the brain. They're considered motor or efferent if they're carrying information from the brain to the muscle. They're considered an interneuron or an association neuron if they are within the brain or sometimes the spinal cord, but they are more of your integration portions of your brain. Most of your motor neurons are going to be multipolar. That's going to be your motor neurons and almost all of your interneurons. Okay. So see here down here, interneurons the one in green, motor neurons the one in red going to the muscle. The bipolar one is going to only be found in the eye. And then your unipolar ones are going to be your sensory neurons. Okay. So let's make sure we all understand what's going on here. We have skin, so that's going to be a receptor taking information to the brain. So we have an unipolar sensory neuron taking the information to the brain. Then you would have your association neurons either just in the spinal cord or all the way in the brain making your integration, your decision. That's going to be the multipolar one. And then you're also going to have a multipolar neuron coming from the brain out to the muscle. Only time you see these bipolar neurons are in the eye. These two tables came directly from your textbook. And I highly recommend that you make sure you read every word on these slides. On your exam, I'm going to not only expect you to be able to label the parts of a multipolar neuron, but I'm going to expect you to be able to match which of the following is multipolar, bipolar, unipolar. Where, what are most of your sensory neurons going to be? Unipolar. Most of your motor neurons are going to be multipolar. The ones in your retina are going to be bipolar. So make sure you spend some time with this. I'm going to stop here with our first lecture. And the next lecture we have, we will be going through how we are going to send information from one neuron to the next. And we're going to see some reoccurring themes like depolarization, repolarization, sodium-potassium pump, those sorts of things that we saw when we looked at muscle contractions.